I'm Deborah Gordon Zaslow, and um, I've lived in the Rogue Valley for over, I think it's, gosh, I got here in the beginning of 1972, so almost 50 years. Um, when I arrived here, I was 20, I'm almost 70 now, so um, I arrived with my first husband I had married very young and um, feminism was a new thing to me um, when I had gotten married in 1970 I had figured out that I would um, learn how to cook and make dinner every night for my husband etc etc and that quickly <laughs> devolved um, I had an older sister who was a little bit of a revolutionary and a um, a college graduate by then and, and um, she was sort of schooling me in feminism which was a new thing um, that Mark my ex-husband and I would have to share the chores I remember when it was his turn to do the dishes I would <clears throat> let those dishes pile up until he did them for days and say nothing and then it was my turn after he did it so I, I was schooling him in that but um, so I got involved in the early feminist movement in Southern Oregon by way of the Women's Health Center. And I'd gotten here in 1972. So in 1973, I went to a, um, a benefit garage sale um, for the Ashland Women's Health Center that was held down in the uh, basement of, I think uh, it was called the Pillars or the Owl coffee house it's kind of where the in Taj Indian restaurant is now but underneath and um, I walked in and there was Amy Horowitz in a pair of roller skates and she was flitting around and she saw me I was wearing an Israeli embroidered top and she had been to Israel a few times and she skated over to me and that was the beginning of my involvement with the Women's Health Center, which was the for the first time, you know, we would we had an off. She Amy was the Vista volunteer. She had somehow arranged to get paid to organize the Women's Health Center, um, and so we had offices that were up above, um, not the plaza, but up where it used to be the Ashland uh, Steakhouse, which was one of the only restaurants in Ashland, the Steakhouse Cafe. Um, and we had these little, you had to walk way up steps, and then there were office buildings there, and then we had a little suite of rooms. So I'm saying we because it was it was really Amy who had organized it, and then it was kind of a collective of women, but she was the paid organizer. I think, you know, what was amazing about that time was I remember thinking there are all these women here who have not ever seen parts of their bodies. Like we have gone to gynecologists who are men and we have been told how to take care of our bodies, how to, how to have babies, how to, all of that. And we were now even though we were not medical professionals, we were saying, oh, these are our bodies and we're going to find out. We would actually <laughs> climb onto these, we had exam tables and I remember we would have like training sessions. I remember volunteering to um, be the model and <laughs> getting up on the table and there's all these women with their you know with a speculum and flashlights like giving exams to me I would never do that now but um it was so exciting to have this happening that we were learning oh and with a mirror this is what this thing inside me my cervix looks like um we had no idea and uh, Amy was at the helm and we would have meetings just these meetings were the first time that I had ever had meetings 
with women, you know, that were all women and they were lesbian women, straight women, older women, not, I don't remember anybody, to to me, old was 40 then, right? (laughs) But there were women who were in there, Amy and I were in our 20s and there were a lot of women who were in their 20s and 30s and then there were some in their 40s and so on. Um, But we would all talk not only about the organization, but, and what we were going to do, but talk about our lives and that that in itself was revolutionary um some of us were married um most were not i had gotten married pretty young um so you know we would i I remember talking we would talk about sexuality we would talk about abortion i was mentioning to you later that the health department the jackson county health department was involved um through amy and um the health department director al kearns would come and talk to us about how to do what to do and i i can't imagine that he would give over all of this stuff to lay professionals, but he was very supportive. I mean, he was genuinely supportive, not just because the health department had directed him to. And um, I have to say that Amy as a lesbian had a way of attracting men. (laughs) And there were a lot, she has a lot, and continues to have a lot of male supporters who are very into helping whatever Amy wants, um, because she's magnetic. And so he would kind of train us in what to do. I don't recall being involved in doing a lot of the medical stuff on clients who came in. I was mostly kind of helping with the organizing and with grant writing because Amy and I discovered very quickly that we were simpatico. And one of the ways that we were simpatico was that we were both writers and we were both articulate. So, um, we would sit down to write a press release or a grant and she would start a sentence and I would finish it. And we would write <clears throat> grant proposals and press releases. And, um, you know, she would I remember her sending me out to talk about the Women's Health Center. Um, she sent me out, there was a, a women's conference and this was probably one of the first at Southern Oregon University. It was in the, the student union, the Rogue Room, Rogue River Room. And um, so I prepared a speech and so on about what the Women's Health Center did. And and then I remember like nobody came and I had this speech, but um, it was just, you know, there was probably about 10 women there because uh, either it hadn't been advertised or there wasn't quite enough juice uh, generated yet for, for women to want to come. Um, one of the things that we did, Amy and I and a couple of other women took a field trip out to Tequilima where there were communes and we went to the Magic Forest Farm because another woman, Jean Sargent, who was a close friend of Amy's at the time, um, she um, had lived there and was now living in Ashland and we went out there to specifically to meet um, Jim Shames, who is now the director of Jackson County Public Health, but he started, he and his wife-to-be, Heidi, started the uh, Tekelma Health Clinic. He was a doctor and uh, a very young doctor, and we all arrived there, and everyone was walking around without their clothes on, so we took our clothes off, <laughs> and we went to the Women's Health um not the Women's Health Clinic, but the Tekelma Health Clinic. And Dr. Shames gave us some, you know, instructions on how to do, what to, how to handle things and so on. Um, So that was my experience with the Tekelma folks who had come from all over to live this ideal life on a commune. And then their idea of free health care for the community was something that we wanted to connect with and then use some of that model for our clinic. Um, I don't know anything about the displaced homeworkers, but the women in transition, which happened um, later in the late 70s, um, I happened to, after my divorce, I lived with a woman named Deirdre Sartorius, who had been part of a commune here and so on, and 
Deirdre, who I'm still kind of in touch with too, who lives on the coast now, was one of the first people involved with WIT, Women in Transition. And of course, the big mover and shaker there was Rosemary Dunn-Dalton, which I'm sure you know about, right? You know about Rosemary. And she really created the Dunn House. Um, but this program was based at SOU. And Deirdre was one of the women who worked with the wits, the women in transition. And there was a whole group of them who ran a counseling center or a women's center at SOU in the later 70s um, for many years. So, and I'm not sure what happened with that program, but that, that there were all these women at SOU or associate, I don't think you had to be a student to come in and use those services. So that was mostly counseling services, helping women um, to you know figure out the logistics of their lives, and particularly women who needed help or shelter or support um, in whatever way that was. And there was a whole group of women who were involved with that. But there was this this heady sense of taking control of our bodies and our lives. I don't remember if the book Our Bodies Ourselves had come out quite yet. But um, that was a very important book for many of us. Um, Ruth Alexander, who was one of the women on the Boston Women's Health Collective, ended up living here many years later. Our daughters were friends in the uh, 80s. Anyway, uh, 80s and 90s, she still lives here, but um, she's not well anymore. But um, Anyway, there was this whole sense of we were doing this. And I remember there was a little bit of a, a disconnect because I was also a, a college student. And I remember being in a, um, like, it was required to take, I don't know, communication speech class in whatever um, liberal arts curriculum I had. And I remember being in this class and everybody, were, they were all like 20 year olds like me, many of whom were male. I remember giving a, a little speech about feminism and about how I had discovered that my beauty wasn't my only asset and um, that how, um, how intoxicating it was to not have to shave my legs or my armpits or, you know, uh, wear makeup. And I remember the horrified looks on the young men in that class. <laughs> I, and I, I wasn't doing it to be shocking. I was just like saying, wow, this is this thing. And they were like, no, it can't be. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was living in that world and also um, the world of women being involved with the Women's Health Center. Um, you know, I, I remember... Um, you know, we would talk about things, we would talk about abortions, we would talk about um, sex, we would talk about our particular, like we would talk about infections and, and things like that. And, you know, I, I, I remember one time I was um, getting, having, going to get an IUD inserted. I remember Amy and my husband came with me, but it was very much in contrast to when I had first had an IUD, I was having one taken out and another one put in because I had the Dalcon shield, which was uh, determined to be dangerous. But when I had first had it put in, I remember when I was, I don't know, um, 19 or something back in Los Angeles, going to Kaiser Permanente and saying that I wanted an IUD. And I remember... Um, you know, waiting in the waiting room and the doctor came in and he said, I mean, this was the conversation we had. He said, here are the ones that I've taken out of other women. And he threw a bunch of them on the, on the table and, and said, it's, if you really want this, I'll do it. I said, well, you know, I, here's, I haven't been able to use birth control pills because they make me sick and I don't want to have another child. I don't want to have any child and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, fine. And he shoved it in. I, I passed out from the pain. And the guy was so insensitive. And that was a, a fairly typical um, response to women's, rather than having a conversation, what can we do about birth control? How do we, you know, um, whereas now what was happening was when I went, 
this time Amy came with me, Mark came with me. We, it was like, we're taking care of you and we're gonna talk with the doctor about what you want and why, why you want it or don't want it. Or, um, but that was a very new thing. You know, um, my sister had recently had a baby and it was revolutionary that she um, had Lamaze classes and she didn't have a home birth like I did a few years later, but she um, had natural childbirth. That was like revolutionary. It's still not everybody does it, but women were, you know, still being sort of, you know, locked into stirrups and drugged and, and um, the idea was that men were in charge. And now men weren't in charge. You know, we were saying we have some say so in our bodies and our lives. Um, I'm trying to remember who else was... Um, was involved, you know, besides Amy and I in the health department, there was a woman named Julie Chapman who was very prominent. Uh, Judith uh, Wright Visser still lives here and was very involved. Um, I can't remember. Um, there were women from all over. Cisco Davis, who was Jane Davis at the time, was involved. Um, there were um, not too women that not too many women that had children, of course, because they didn't have too much time. But um, it was kind of a variety of women and a a group effort. Um, you know, and eventually I, um, you know, Amy left. Um, that that women's health center became the Ashland Community Health Center. I don't know if you know that. Um, and Kathy Shaw was one of the, um, I think she was the executive director. And my friend Julie Teitelbaum, who was Julie Schwartz then, worked um, as a technician there. Um, I don't know how that happened, how that transition happened. And I think, um, you know, I got busy with finally you know trying to finish college and other things that were going on in my life like um, my mother dying and a divorce and so on um, but I think the um, the whole gestalt of what was happening stayed with me and in that sense you know I I became in the um, 80s and so on, I, I became a, a storyteller. I became a teacher and a storyteller. Um, I remember my first teaching job in 78, I taught third grade in Central Point, and I remember <clears throat> we had career day. And on that day, we were supposed to talk about careers. And Central Point was not quite as... Um, highly conscious as Ashland. Um, so in my, we had to do activities that had to do with careers. So my activity was, um, I did a, a survey with third graders and we had different groups rotating in and I listed a bunch of jobs and said, what do you think of male or female when I say these jobs and they would check it off. And then we talked about the stereotypes with these little eight year olds and nine-year-olds, and I remember the other teachers thinking, this isn't a career day activity. <laughs> this is that Ashland teacher with a feminist. But I, it was, it was eye-opening, you know, to the kids. And then to talk about, well, if, if I say doctor and you say female, what is, why wouldn't a, a female be able to be a doctor. And it was really interesting to have these discussions and see what the boys said and what the girls said and, and so on. So I carried that in and when I became a storyteller, very quickly I realized that all of these stories that I was telling and I was telling them to kids and now I tell more to adults, that all of the heroes, and these were mostly European fairy tales and so on, folk tales, all of the heroes were male. 
And at the same time, I was realizing that um, stories have a deep influence on our psyche. I was reading, you know, Carl Jung and Bruno Bettelheim. And so I started looking for collections of stories that had women who were more than just passive princesses waiting to be rescued. So um, that became a thing of mine that I would, I went around after, after I started having kids in the 80s and then became a professional storyteller, I would go and tell stories at schools and stuff. And that was my, um, part of my specialty. So, um, and it remains that to this day when I tell stories and I tell stories in, uh, my husband now is a rabbi, different husband than the first one. <laughs> um, you know, we've been married for about 40 years and, um, uh, my specialty is telling Jewish stories now and spiritual stories, but I kind of, um, I change those with my storyteller's license. In fact, I'm working now on a collection with another group, with a group of Jewish women who are taking some of the old traditional Hasidic stories and um, changing the endings or featuring women because even God language, calling God he, um, all of that and having the main characters be men has a huge influence on girls who are listening to these stories. You know, it's really discouraging to have your role models only be, you know, passive and sort of helpmates rather than active heroines. So, um, you know, there's still so much work to be done. You know, we just had a, um, you know, our new vice president is going to be a woman. You know, countries all over the world have had women leaders, but not the United States. So, I mean, sexism is so incredibly um, insidious and pervasive, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I've seen a lot of changes. We've had um, women mayors here. We have another one now. But, uh, and women certainly have more of a, of a strong voice than they did in the 70s, but um, there's still, a, you know, a deep sense of um, sexism that has permeated our culture that, you know, um, that we still have to deal with. Yeah. The women at the Women's Health Center were women who lived here. Although, you know, they were, they had come from other places. I remember sitting at a meeting and there were all of us kind of hippie women <laughs> sitting there and in walked, um, oh, what's her name? Annette Pugh. And Annette and Lance, who are both dead now, um, Annette was also a young woman, but a little older than us. And she was wearing a beautiful dress and walking in very regally. And she owned a whole part of downtown, she and Lance. And uh, Lithia Grocery was the main one that she owned. And she walked in and said, I would like to help. And we were like, you would? <laughs> You're a woman who has some stature and some money and some... And she said, yes, I want to be involved. And she came in and I don't recall her being involved later, but I, I don't know if she donated money or if she got involved in an activity or whatever. But she was local, but she had they had moved here from somewhere else. And all of the other women lived here. Um, and including those at the gathering, I don't recall there being other women um um, but there were plenty of women in Southern Oregon who were interested in coming. So Amy was really um, responsible for saying, let's have a women's festival. And she, I talked to her recently and she, and we remained friends for 50 years. Uh, I'm the godmother of her daughter and <clears throat> so on. But she says that there was an original <clears throat> meeting of women's space that um, I don't know about. But what I remember was <clears throat> having a big, we decided to have a big gathering. And it was at uh, what's now called Camp Latgawa. Then it was called Soda Springs. <clears throat> and, or at least we called it that. 
And we had several meetings to organize that. I mean, there aren't many people who can organize a big event, especially, I mean, Amy was 21 years old, but it was, there were hundreds of women and we had um, all kinds of workshops. So this came out of Amy's work with Women's Health, but it really was the outgrowth of feminism and the women's culture that was evolving. Um, and we're, I remember we had a lot of meetings up in that health center to organize this conference. It was a weekend. It was like a two day. Yeah, because there was one overnight. Um, there were workshops on, I remember going to a writing workshop. I remember going to um, Sylvia Goodman, who was a, a Reiki and therapist in town. And she had a, a whole workshop. Um, um, I, I I remember I'm trying to remember the, the name of the woman who was in charge of food, but we all brought all kinds of food and she cooked it, huge meals. And um, I remember um, spending the night in uh, a cabin. Um, I remember staying up all night talking with other women. I mean, there were so many um, things that were going on there. And I remember I, I made a huge banner and I have no idea if this banner still exists that said women's space. And I had, I'd gotten the idea from my sister, but I had all these uh, made of fabric women's symbols on this huge banner. And then I made a big circle. And then around that I had, and I'm not a much of a stitchery person, but back then I was motivated. So we had this huge banner in fabric that said women's space. Um, Apparently, it became Woman's Source after that. That was the only gathering that I went to. And 20 years after that, so that was like in 72 or something, or 74, I, it was before Amy left. It must have been about 74, yeah. Um, 20 years later, in 94, I was part of a, a troop, kind of an improv group called Playback Theater. And we were asked to come up uh, to the, it was a Girl Scout camp by um, Lake of the Woods. And they had the the 20th um, reunion of women's, it was called Women's Source. And we came up and there were about, oh gosh. I don't know, there were, there were maybe, there were less than 100 women, but it was a good size group in a in a hall or whatever and then we did a playback performance of women's stories through the years um, so a lot of my friends now who were in you know 60s and 70s i mean i don't mean the 1960s and 1970s i mean we're we're older now and um you know we we've mellowed a bit but we're still i think adamant about being in charge of our lives and our bodies so um, some things have changed and some things haven't. Um, so you and I were talking a little bit about the issue of right to life before. And I, I would say um, that in the 70s, for the first time, you know, we were talking about, you know, abortion had not been legal. And I was saying to you before that in the... Um, in 1968, at 17 years old, I had an abortion on a kitchen table in Sunset Boulevard, which was a horrifying, terrible experience. And when I got to Southern Oregon and in the 70s, and we were, it was the first time we were really talking about abortion, I was talking with women who were having abortions and kind of taking it, not for granted, but very grateful that now we could get safe and legal abortions. That was a huge step. And, you know, um, I'm a rabbi's wife now. And so I'm, a, I would say, a spiritual religious woman, but I'm adamant about right to life. I'm not right to life, but right to choose. Um, and... You know, um, I was saying to you before that I have a nephew who's was a big mucky muck in, in um, the Narrow, 
uh, organization in New York. And we've had conversations about this because I have what I would call a religious um, view that includes a woman's right to choose, which I think to many fundamentalists is unthinkable. And, you know, my belief is that that cons- at the moment of conception, there is life, which is a, a position that's untenable in terms of fighting for abortion rights. But I can reconcile that because I feel like it's part of the incredible, abundant life force that is God. And it's available all the time. It, it, life is everywhere, in the trees, in the grass, in the birds and being offered all the time, all the seeds that are dropping from the trees. And I throw out a lot of those seeds and I feel like a woman has the right to say, thank you God for the sacred offer. No, thank you. This is not the time for me to bear life. I think women are the sacred holders of life and we have to be given absolute uh, sovereignty over our own holy bodies and totally are capable of saying no and to me that's not any kind of sin uh, at all it's just a saying no thank you not right now and there will still be abundance so um you know i've also um you know thinking about i haven't done this yet but in terms of having you know ceremonies that honor life and honor the choice of abortion, um, you know, complete with prayers and rituals and so on. Um, I've been part of doing um, mikvahs after abortions and miscarriages and so on. Mikvah is a ritual immersion. We have a mikvah bath in Southern Oregon and with women and um, as part of a lot of women's ceremonial work that I'm involved with as the wife of a rabbi. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to include any of that or if that has anything to do with the history of Southern Oregon, but that's kind of how it's manifested in me as um, a spiritual woman who would still call herself a feminist. You know, my daughter, by the way, who's just turned 39 the other day, is a midwife. And she has a PhD in women's studies. And she um, has a birthing clinic in um, Uganda, it's, she's, she implemented it, started it, funds it, but it's run by the traditional birthing attendants there. Um, and, you know, I like to think that my spirit of feminism inspired her, although she's a pretty much self-made young woman. But, um, you know, she's working in an area of women's bodies and is a very strong feminist and um, is very influential in that area in the world. So that's kind of a um, a little effect. And Amy's daughter is a young feminist as well. She's a lot younger, but um, yeah, I, I like to think we've spawned this generation of, of women uh, that's the only way I can take credit for, you know, probably <laughs> Rachel, is, my daughter's done more in her life than I have in my life. And I love that. I love the fact that she's out there doing the, the work. So, well, I don't know. I, I would say that, you know, now almost 50 years later, we're looking at a, a world that in many ways looks um, very different. We have a woman vice president, um, we have uh, women news anchors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like there's still um, a lot of work to be done. You know, like I was saying, we have women news anchors, but they're, you know, still um, have to be very gorgeous and sexy and so on. There's still a pervasive sense of who women are and women's place. And if you talk to any of these women, they will tell you, that they have had to work tooth and nail to get where they are. So there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, we have, right now we have abortion rights, but they're really threatened. And we have the Supreme Court that's come in, the new. Um, so 
I'm banking on the strength of the younger generation, like my daughter, who is a feminist and a midwife, like so many of the young women that I know, uh, children of my friends who are doctors and lawyers and are doing amazing things in this world. And, um, you know, I think that we sowed those seeds and we were really lucky to be um, at the vanguard of, wow, we could actually do things for ourselves. We could take control of our own bodies. We can, we can perhaps direct the conversation. So I hope that that directing of the conversation has manifested in a larger conversation that's still going on, but that has, you know, a little bit of the blossoms from the seeds of what that we sowed in the seventies.